Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for coming today. My name is Michaela Dahlstrom, and I am the design team lead for Team Descent, and we are here today to present to you Project Hummingbird. Before we begin, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce the team to you. First and foremost, my assistant team lead and working within the structure subsystem, Simon Polder. Sean Akana, systems lead. Eric Vieira, electrical and systems. Nasser Alimutari, systems and propulsion. Alkina Riley, propulsion lead. Ashley Brickstrom, electrical. Kenji Cristel, systems and electrical. Dakota Berkland, electrical lead. Jesse Rodriguez, electrical. Kyle Miller, structures lead. David Wright, structures. And finally over here, we have Jennifer Deal who's working in electrical and structures. In the beginning of the semester, Team Descent is presented with a few stakeholder needs, which would ultimately determine the design of our project. These needs included having a reusable aerial payload delivery system, hence worth known as an APDS, that could soft land a payload in a precise, predetermined area. The fifth and final need of the stakeholder was for this to become a legacy project, in which case Ember Riddle would pull the hummingbird out to use as a demonstration piece to inspire prospective students to continue their education here at Ember Riddle. The APDS options considered by Team Descent were gliders, parachutes, airbags, landers, and sky cranes. The sky crane was ultimately chosen for its ability to generate its own thrust, which would allow it to hover above the ground while lowering the payload to the surface, negating the need to land the entire apparatus on top of the payload during delivery, and also avoiding a phenomenon called brownout, in which case the downwash from the propellers could damage or contaminate the payload or the hummingbird vehicle itself. We are a space track team, however we are inspired by space missions but we must be able to test here on Earth. There were two major sources of inspiration for the project. This extraterrestrial inspiration was a sky crane that delivered the Mars Curiosity rover in 2012. As you can see in the sequence of figures behind me, it was able to generate its own thrust, lower the Curiosity rover to Mars, detach and fly away. The terrestrial inspiration for Team Descent is the Sikorsky Sky Crane. It was originally intended in 1962 for military purposes, but is now being used for a multitude of reasons, including construction and firefighting efforts. Our concept of operations is as followed. The payload will be attached to the Hummingbird vehicle. The system will be turned on and a systems check will ensue to ensure all components are working correctly. The Hummingbird will then ascend to an altitude of 200 feet. It does not have to fly the entire mission at this altitude, but it would be able to withstand it per our requirements. The hummingbird with the attached payload will travel to the predetermined area. If need be, the hummingbird will be able to travel at a pitch angle of 30 degrees, seen in the animation behind me. Once the payload gets to the landing zone, that's when the sky crane operations begin. The payload will be landed and lowered to the ground using the tethers. They will be detached from the solenoid claws. These tethers will then be retracted back up into the hummingbird system. The sky crane will reorient reascend to an altitude controlled by the operator, and return back home. Once it reaches a second predetermined landing zone, the hummingbird itself will be soft landed to await another delivery. And now I'd like to hand it over to Sean Akana, who will talk about the objectives and requirements of Team Descent's mission. Thank you, Michaela, and thank you everyone for being here. I'll be going over the objectives and requirements of the hummingbird system. So Team Descent identified eight primary objectives for our Hummingbird. These objectives, uh, primary objectives are, sorry, these primary objectives have to be met in order for the stakeholder and customer to minimally accept the system. Our primary objectives are designated by the PO and our needs that we generated them from are at the end of the statement. Our primary objectives are as follows. The Hummingbird should be reusable, land to be recovered, soft land the payload, take off with the payload attached, transport the payload, fly in, fly in a stable configuration, land in a predetermined area, and be controlled by one operator. In addition to our primary objectives, we have identified four secondary objectives. These are objectives that will help uh, give value to our system. We use SO to designate our secondary objectives, and these are that the hummingbird should avoid payload landing zone disturbance, traverse above or around obstacles, land the payload upright, and become a legacy project here in Rio Arizona. Finally, we have four tertiary objectives at value to our system. These are designated TO, and they are to keep the setup and stowage time to a minimum, travel at a high speed, land the payload on different types of terrains, and look aesthetically pleasing. Panelists, in front of you, you will see a long sheet of paper with our requirements hierarchy. From uh, our objectives, we generated requirements. We have 17 system level requirements and 27 system level requirements. Uh, the top four 
above me are topmost system level requirements, and we broke this down into our system, or lower system level requirements, we broke this down into our subsystem level requirements to help determine our components. Now I'd like to bring up Eric Beard to talk about our configuration. Thank you, Sean. My name is Eric Vieira. <clears throat> Today I'm going to be discussing our thruster type selection, our thruster configuration selection, and the system integration for Project Hummingbird. Initially, Team Descent considered five different types of thrusters for Project Hummingbird. We looked at cold gas thrusters, aerodynamic propellers, liquid rocket engines, monopropellant rocket engines, and ducted fans. Cold gas thrusters were found not to produce enough lift or provide the maneuverability required for this mission. Both liquid rocket engines and monopropellant rocket engines were deemed too complex and unsafe for a capstone engineering project that wasn't dedicated solely to their construction. Ducted fans were found to have about 50% the efficiency of open aerodynamic propellers, which were selected as the best choice for this mission. When considering any configuration of propellers for a multi-copter vehicle like the Hummingbird, any configuration's purpose is to provide movement in both vertical and horizontal directions. For one and two propeller configurations, complex gimbling and control algorithms are required to fly the vehicle easily. Three, five, and other odd-numbered propeller configurations require control algorithms and power distribution configurations, which are more complex than for four, six, and other even-numbered propeller configurations. When comparing a four and six propeller configuration setup, the four propeller configuration was chosen because it was lighter by 1.7 pounds, cheaper by $313, and less complex. As far as system integration goes, the Hummingbird will be flown by a single operator from the ground using a radio frequency controller. It will use the Global Positioning Satellite System to send coordinates to the operator, who will then use that information to help navigate the vehicle throughout the mission. It will utilize the state's power grid between missions to charge the batteries which are used for powering the propulsion devices as well as the other mechanical and electrical devices on board. And the environment will contain obstacles and dust in the payload landing zone, which needs to be avoided to not contaminate the payload. Next, I'm going to be bringing up Nasser Amitari to talk about our propellers. Thank you, Eric. My name is Nasser Amitari, and I will discuss our <coughs> propeller component selection. The propeller is responsible for contributing to the requirement listed at the top of this slide. The most important of these requirements is that the thrusting devices are capable of the thrust. The most important of these requirements is that the thrusting devices are capable of producing 44 pounds of thrust. In order to satisfy this requirement, propellers must be chosen that are capable of producing this output at a reasonable rotational velocity. A trade study was initially conducted to analyze the thrust each propeller must output. From our research advice from faculty, it was found that multi-rotor vehicles are, are typically built to, be at, to have at least a thrust to weight ratio of two. Therefore, our estimated total loaded system was 22, 22 pounds. The needed output was 44 pounds of thrust. As Eric described, the configuration of the system was determined to be four motors, which means that every motor has to produce 11 pounds of thrust. We decided to choose, we decided to choose an APC brand, brand, we decided to choose an APC brand propeller because the company provides the performance data to their products. Our selection is the APC 18 by 5.5 propeller. We choose that. We choose that because we choose that because we choose that because it's fairly inexpensive and has a large, efficient propeller of 18 inches and also produces 10, 
10 to 10 to 10 to 10 to 14 pounds of thrust at 6,000 to 7,000 revolution per minute, which satisfied our requirement. Next, I would like to bring up Elkan O'Reilly, and he will discuss about our next our next component selection and analysis. Thank you, Nasser. My name is Elkan O'Reilly. I'm the propulsion subsystem team lead, and I'll be discussing our motor component selection analysis and our height of hover during our payload deployment. So. The way we are the most significant or influencing requirements are the propulsion subsystem requirements located at the top of this slide. We needed, our, our process for choosing was we needed a motor that would give us our necessary rotational velocity while not drawing more current than it is capable of, hand, of handling. So we used a decision matrix for this choice. From this decision matrix, we our choice was a was the Cobra 435 kV motor from Innovative Designs, based from its kV rating and our operating voltage of 22.2 volts. We found that its maximum theoretical rotational velocity is 9,675, or I'm sorry, 57 RPM, which gives us a satisfactory margin of safety from the range described by us. Behind me is the propeller, or I'm sorry, is the uh, propeller and motor propeller combination uh, thrust analysis. Based on our manufacturer, we found that our our propeller uh, thrust curve is the blue line located behind me. The yellow line is our motor and propeller combination uh, thrust uh, thrust test data from our manufacturer. However, that test was conducted at 500 at a 500 foot altitude, and we needed to compensate for that for our current altitude here in Prescott, Arizona. That curve is shown by the purple curve. We are fairly confident with our with our uh, calibrated data here, since the blue diamond is a known experimental value using our specific propeller, courtesy of the detailed design team ascent ascension. Sorry, the green dashed horizontal line it indicates our 11 total pounds of required thrust per motor therefore you can see at about 7000 rpm we will we should be producing our required thrust the red solid line and sh and red uh, shaded region indicate the maximum theoretical unloaded rotational velocity of our motor as i previously described and the vertical dashed red line indicates our maximum rotational velocity before we will draw, before we will overdraw current for the motor. We conducted a proportionality test, test for our height of hover using our personal UAVs. We found in order to determine how high we would have to hover without disturbing a substrate on the ground, we found that Using the data, we used a polynomial curve fit, and we found, you assuming 22 pounds of thrust for, uh, for our system to hover, that we would need 17 feet above the ground in order to not disturb the terrain. However, we have an electrical requirement which says that during hover, we can deviate in altitude by three feet. Therefore, we added that to our height. And finally, we added a design margin of 25, a final design margin of 25%, which yielded a total height of 25 feet for our higher power. Next, I would li like to give the floor to Ashley Burson, who will discuss our next component selection. Thank you, Will. I'm Ashley, and I'll be discussing the electronic speed controller selection. So an electronic speed controller is exactly what you'd expect. It's a device that controls the speed of an electric motor as well as its direction. And that being said, Team Descent put requirements in place for our project and the one that pertains to this component specifically is a need for 44 pounds of thrust. We then conducted a trade study in order to find the best component with a couple different measures of merit that fit our project. Those measures of merit were max current draw, optimization of size, weight, and expense in that order. 
We decided to go with Eternity Super Brain 80 Amp Brushless Speed Controller because primarily the max current draw that this device can support. The Super Brain can support 80 amps of current draw, and the max current draw for the motors on the Hummingbird is only 54 amps, which means this device can support 26 amps above our max, which is very helpful. Additionally, although it was one of the more expensive options, costing about $70, at 57.5 grams it was the lightest, helping to keep us within our weight budget. It was also the best fit for the restraints put in place by the Structure Subsystem Group, as far as size is concerned. Another beneficial factor of this device that we can use during flight is an integrated data flight log, or an integrated flight data logger, which can excuse me, which can log data such as voltage, current, temperature, motor RPM, and throttle travel for the entirety of the flight. So, although this feature did not impact our selection process, it is something we can use during flight and can aid in mission analysis. Lastly, this is a recommended name brand by professors on campus, which is reassuring the team descent, which is why we decided to go with the Eternity Super Brain. That being said, considering the research done, Team Tissent has concluded that this selection will help us satisfy this requirement. Next, I'd like to invite Kenton up to speak on the next compliment. Thank you, Ashley. My name is Kenton Christel, and I'm going to be going over the battery and charger selection for Team Tissent. So our batteries have two requirements that they have to satisfy. The first of this is that we need to get at least 30 cycles, but preferably 60 cycles for charge and discharge of these batteries. And also, we need to be able to power the system for 15 minutes of flight time. So using these minimal requirements, electrical and propulsion worked closely together to create a MATLAB code to predict engine performance, and found that the minimum milliamp hour requirement for our energy storage devices would be 18,000 milliamp hours. And also, we would need to have a 25C discharge rate to be able to satisfy the maximum amperage draw from the motors. So using those, we looked at different battery combinations that would be capable of supporting that. And we performed a trade study. The factors that used to down-select during that trade study were weight, cost, the amount of batteries required for that combination, and also the batteries, that the, the volume that those batteries would uh, occupy. So using those, we found that the battery choice that would satisfy the requirements best was using three Thunder Power TP6000 6 SPX25 batteries that will be wired in parallel to satisfy the 18,000 milliamp hour requirement and give us our desired motor performance. Also related to this is the charger. We need to be able to recharge our batteries within 50 minutes according to the requirement above me. And Using uh, the battery size and also looking at different charging amperages, we found that the best charger for this would be the TP820 HVC2 port LiPo charger. It's a smart charger. It has an LCD display that allows the user to see information on the battery charging status. And also, we're able to charge two, um, two batteries at once. And with a charging amperage of 20 amps, we're able to charge these batteries in 18 minutes, which means that we're going to have to use two batteries since we have three batteries, and a total charge time of 36 minutes, satisfying the requirement. Next, I'd like to invite up Dakota. We'll go over our next components and analysis. Thank you, Ken. I'm Dakota Berkeley. I'm the electrical subsystem team lead. And I'll be talking to you today about the flight controller and the receiver selection. So relating requirements to the flight controller is that software correctly executes user input. So for one operator, it has a five foot radius horizontal hover and a max horizontal velocity of two feet per second while in hover. And then you attain, maintain an altitude with the deviation of three feet. As well as uh, allow sensor suite to allow for a hover over a desired area. So we also have the requirements of 30 degree pitch angle and a 30 degree roll angle. So determining features for these during our trade studies was the cost, the precision of the vertical hover, the precision of the horizontal hover, as well as the maximum the flight controller could maintain stability in. The flight controller choice is the DJI NASA M Lite flight controller with the GPS and compass integrated. This includes a sensor suite with an IMU magnetometer, as well as uh, the GPS system that is attached with it and a barometer. So the vertical deviation is 2.6 feet and the horizontal deviation is 8.2 feet. Successfully meeting the requirements above and has a max pitch and roll angle. The receiver 
is used to communicate between the operator on the ground and the flight computer on board the hummingbird. So this is, helps, aids in the requirement of the accessibly uh, executes user input. Primary determining features when selecting our VR trace studies was SBUS compatibility, which is a single line input, allowing for less wiring inside the Hummingbird. So there's one wire going from the receiver to the radio control, flight controller. It has failed safe and hold functions that can be adapted, or if connection is lost, it will automatically send a hold function to the flight controller. The telemetry function, allows telemetry to be sent back down to the operator and view what's going on on the system while in the air. <coughs> Seven channel minimum to use the maximum, to allow for the maximum use of our flight controller and our radio controller. Dual antennas to avoid any null points with RF signals. So the final selection was the uh, Hi-Tech Optima SL S-Bus eight channel receiver. And now I'd like to bring up Jesse Rodriguez who will talk about the next component. Thank you, Dakota. My name is Jesse Rodriguez, and I'll be talking about the radio controller. The radio controller has one requirement. Um, the Hummingbird shall have software that correctly executes user's input. What you used to determine which radio controller we should select was the cost, the amount of channels it has, the latency, the auxiliary input, if it has a receiver included, and if it has a rechargeability function. What we ended up going with was a high-tech Flash 7 because it had a cost of $180, which was relatively low in comparison to its competition. It had seven channels at a latency of 55 milliseconds. It had enough auxiliary inputs to accomplish the mission, but it did not have a receiver included nor rechargeability function. Although it did not have these two, um, these two points, it still beat its competition. We were not able to test the radio controller because we have not purchased the radio controller, nor do we have a uh, Hummingbird. Built yet. So instead, we decided to look at the specification sheets for all of our components, and they do uh, work together with the radio controller to control the hummingbird. Along with that, we also looked at the reviews for the radio controller, and we saw that the reviews ranged from four to five stars out of five. With this, we should be able to satisfy our requirement. Now, I'd like to bring up Simon Pulcher to talk about his components. Thank you, Jesse. I'm Simon Pulcher. I'm the assistant design team lead for Team Descent, and I will be talking about our landing gear, the sky crane system, our cowlings, and the internal wire routing for Project Hummingbird. Our landing gear is a simple fixed gear system. It has to provide at least two inches of ground clearance for our payload and be able to survive an impact force of six feet per second. A material trade study was conducted to determine what we wanted to use to build this. We looked at various types of woods, a few metals, and some composites, but the final selection was 7075 aluminum for its resistance to bending, lightweight, high strength, nature, and also it doesn't, it's not susceptible to cracking or splintering as wood and composite may be. You can see here in the diagram behind me, it does provide our two inches of ground clearance necessary. Also, a buckling analysis was done on the smallest section I'm gonna point out here, Right there, the analysis was conducted for buckling, and it was determined it could survive a 1,236-pound buckling uh, before buckling. Our anticipated force for the six foot per second drop was 1,036 pounds, which means we have some good design margin, and it should survive our forces without any issues. The sky crank claw is what is used to attach the payload to the Hummingbird system. So it has to be capable of remotely detaching the payload and also needs to be able to interface with an eight by eight by six, two pound payload. A system trade study was performed to determine what type of release mechanism we wanted to use. We considered mechanical release types, a solenoid claw mechanism, electromagnetic release, and a simple tethered detachment system. But the one we finally went with was our solenoid release system which was the most simple and lightweight, only has two moving parts. You can see the design solution behind me on the slide. And this is a very lightweight, low power draw system. The entire three-claw system uses 0.285 pounds and will, per detachment, uses 1.43 milliamp hours of power. So it's a very low power draw system. An analysis was conducted to determine if it would release properly from the payload or not. 
We used the assumptions of the coefficient of static friction for 70-75 aluminum, and it was designed to a 7.5 pound payload to ensure it would be able to release even in an emergency situation where we were perhaps accelerating upwards with the payload hanging on to the hummingbird. It was determined that the solenoid cloud would be able to release with a 1.09 pound margin, design margin, which should account for any additional friction or binding forces that may occur during actual testing. The tether system is what's used to connect the solenoid claws to the hummingbird itself. Again, the related requirements are being able to remotely detach the payload, and it has to be able to interface with the 8x8x6 eight by eight by two-pound payload. The sky crane tether is what allows us to lower our payload the 25 feet necessary to avoid any uh, substrate kick up or dust contamination of the payload. So a trade study was conducted to determine what we wanted to use for the load bearing tether material. We looked at paracord, some conductive wires and tape, but the final selection was braided fishing line due to its high strength, low weight, very low diameter nature. Now the tether or the fishing line tether rather does not supply power that we need for the solenoid attachment mechanism. So each tether is going to consist of the load bearing element, which is the wire, and we also have 28 gauge insulated wire which runs our power down to each of our solenoid claws. So it is a two wire system, which makes it a little more complex, but during testing it was verified that it could, it could sustain all of the weights and also the spool that we're going to talk about in a minute was capable of winding both on without any issues. The spool is what allows us to retract and lower the payload as needed for landing operations. The requirement related to this is being able to land the payload under one foot per second to avoid dust contamination and avoid damage to the payload. A trade study was conducted on what type of setup we wanted to use. The final selection you can see behind me is a single spool motor, single spool system that feeds all three tethers in. I'm going to take a minute to talk about this diagram. You can see our, our winch motor up here connecting to our spool system. It's a three channel spool, we'll go over in, in a moment. And then those tether wires feed through the eyelets, through this triangle spacer right here, which is to prevent any tangling of the wires when unloaded. And then they feed to the solenoid claws, which connect and detach the payload. This is a closer view of our spool that we designed. This is a 3D printed version of our spool, which we did testing on to ensure that it would wind properly. Notice that this spool is broken into three separate sections. This is to avoid any unnecessarily, an unnecessary tangling or friction caused by spooling on the wires. So each tether will have its individual section of the spool, which should prevent any binding or issues with tethers overlapping each other. An analysis was done based on a 27 RPM motor to determine what our wind speed would be. We had a maximum wind speed of 0.59 feet per second and a minimum wind speed of 0.4 feet per second. So both of these are well below our one foot per second requirement, which means we should be landing our payload softly per the requirement. Our sky crane motor is what runs this entire system. Again, it has to be able to lower the payload at under one foot per second. The trade study conducted for the motor was first we looked at a, just a straight electric motor with no gearing, but it was determined that a motor large enough to provide our required torque would be too large for the Hummingbird system. So we needed a geared motor. We looked at creating a custom gearbox, but instead decided to go with a pre-made spur gear motor, which simplified our design and met all of our requirements. Our final choice is shown behind me. It's the Electric Craft Series 116 spur gear motor. It provides 31 inch-pounds of torque, and an analysis determined that our generated torque on the winch system, or on the spool system, was 19 inch-pounds by the hanging payload. So that 31 inch-pounds of torque gives us a good design margin to overcome any frictional forces or additional in-flight forces we haven't anticipated yet. So it should satisfy all of our requirements. The next component designed by the structure subsystem were the cowlings. Now primarily, these cowlings relate to our aesthetic requirements of having 70% of stakeholders thinking the, the system is visually appealing and having blue and colored, gold colored surfaces to match the ember riddle paint scheme. However, it does satisfy some legitimate structural requirements as well, by having 75% of the non tether wires tucked into the surface and supplying structure for some of our flight controller elements as well. 
A trade study was conducted to determine what elements we wanted to add to our system as far as aesthetics. So we looked at commercially available drones and what they added to their elements to make their systems visually appealing. We found that common throughout was a lightweight plastic cowling, a symmetrical side-to-side -side design, an established front and rear of the drone, and also internally wired an internally wired system. This is our design solution that we came up with behind me. You see we have an established front and rear of the system, side-to-side -side symmetry. We have the smooth, paintable surface. All of our flight equipment is covered. And all of our wires are internally routed. You'll notice the system is ported. There are ventilation systems here. Also, the front is ventilated, as well as the rear. Our electrical system does generate quite a lot of heat, so we wanted sufficient airflow to cool that system and make sure we don't damage any of our components. So this component should satisfy all of our stakeholder requirements by meeting the aesthetic approval, providing the paintable surfaces, as this will be 3D printed PLA plastic, and it will also provide space for internal wire routing. A trade study was conducted on internal wire routing to determine if it was worthwhile, and the main things that we looked at were user safety and avoiding damaged wiring, which is why we decided to route our wires internally. Our system does produce very high amounts of power, and we want to prevent any injury to our users, uh, which is us, so we want to avoid any potential damage to ourselves, and also we want to avoid any potential damage to the system. We don't want anyone snagging any of the wires, disconnecting any wires, which could potentially damage our mission success. So, this upper cowling provides the primary internal wiring space. It covers all of our flight components, as you see here, our batteries, winch system, and our flight computer as well. All of those wires will be inside the upper cowling. The system also has a space between the two booms. I'm going to refer to our mock-up here. And that space in between the hub sheets, not the booms, the hub sheets, provides space for the uh, SkyTrain system and all of the wiring connected to that. The booms that you see here and here are hollow and provide space for our motor wires, so all the power that we need to supply our, our motors. We have very thick wires, but fortunately our booms provide a perfect space to route those internally to avoid any damage or injury. This should satisfy our requirement by providing about 90% of our wires being tucked into the system, which is well above our 75% requirement. Now Kyle Miller will finish off the structure subsystem. Thank you, Simon. Like I said, my name is Kyle Miller, and I will be going over the Hummingbird's airframe, as well as the overall system configuration for certain components. So the airframe has two requirements related to it, and they are that it must survive a six feet per second impact um, and in addition to this, it also um, should be visually appealing since it will be visible to an external observer. The airframe itself is comprised of the load-bearing components to which all other components will be attached. It must support and accommodate all of these components. Um, and uh, when analyzing which components to choose for this, for the airframe, we looked at maximum structural stresses, which occurred during maximum engine thrust, as well as uh, upon landing impact. So the first component were the airframe hub sheets uh, shown here, and um, these are really the central, they're the center of the hummingbird, the most important structural component. And performing a material trade study, we eventually came down to the decision that we needed carbon fiber, or we would like to use carbon fiber hub sheets uh, with dimensions of 1 8 inch thickness as well as approximately a 0.7 square foot projected area. And the specific um, sheets that we chose, uh, which we are buying from a manufacturer, uh, have the layup shown here. They are comprised of a quasi, uh, each layer is comprised of a quasi-isotropic, um, or the entire sheet is a quasi-isotropic layup, the top layer of which is a bidirectional twill weave layer, and the second layer, shown in the gray, is a is the same bidirectional twill weave layer oriented 45 degrees relative to the first. This pattern is repeated four times down to the midplane of the sheet, where it is reflected symmetrically. 
we, we have the hub sheets oriented such that half of the layers will have fibers parallel to the booms in order to maximize our resistance to bending stresses due to engine thrust. The, in addition to this, um, the manufacturer has given us a tensile strength of 512 KSI, which is extremely strong. However, this is not directly a correlation to bending strength. It does show that the carbon fiber sheets are extremely strong and should have no problem meeting our expected or our maximum landing impact speed of six feet per second. The airframe booms are the second component of the airframe and they, using a similar material trace study, we also chose that they should be made of carbon fiber. Their dimensions are, are they have a square cross section with dimensions of approximately three quarter inch side lengths. The length of the booms will be 13 inches. Cutouts shown here on the top and bottom side of the boom uh, will be used to mount the electronic speed controllers. Notice that the bottom cutout is in order to allow airflow over the electronic speed controllers, which tend to heat up quite a bit during operation. Holes are also cut on this end to allow for the mounting of the motors to provide thrust, and on this end to mount the booms themselves to the airframe hub sheets. We believe that this will be sufficient to help us meet the requirement of a six feet per second impact, as well as being visually appealing due to the carbon fiber material. Lastly, I'd like to go over where some important major components are on the Hummingbird. Starting here at the end of the booms, we have the motors and the propellers, which will provide thrust to the system. Moving inwards along the booms, we have the electronic speed controllers, which will control the speed of the motors and the rotational rate of the propellers indirectly. In this, moving to the center, we have the three batteries uh, in red shown here surrounding the central surrounding the central motor, which will drive the sky crane winch system. Above them, directly above them, is located the flight computer as well as the GPS unit, which are mounted to our upper cowling. Moving forward, we have a GoPro Hero Session uh, mounted, which will be facing downward in order to help us with landing landing a payload precisely at a, at a long range, dis long distance away, where a line of sight is not sufficient. Moving below the hummingbird, we have the sky crane claws here, which are, will be used to grip the payload. And lastly, we have the landing gear, which will provide us with over two inches of payload clearance from the ground. Now I will bring Michaela Dahlstrom back up to conclude the presentation. Thank you, Kyle. To conclude, Team Sense believes that we are ready to move on to the next phase of the design process by actually manufacturing a Hummingbird prototype. We believe we are ready for this next step because all of our requirements are expected to be satisfied and the analysis are showing optimistic results for typical Hummingbird operations. Team Ascent would like to thank the following people on the screen, either for their engineering, intellectual, material, or financial contributions to Team Ascent and Project Hummingbird. This concludes today's briefing, at which point I would like to invite the entirety of Team Ascent up to join me and open the floor to any questions. matrix, what were the parameters that went into them? 
you know, what were the factors that you considered, and then the weightings on those, those might have been interesting to see to help you understand how you go to your, your final day. I just got a sense of, these were things that looked at, here's the guy we got. And, and I didn't really get the sense of the rationale for some of those. Uh, one thing that uh, was a bit unclear was uh, what, what's the system block diagram for this overall system. I, I saw all the different pieces, but I never saw kind of an overview of, okay, this is how the whole system fits together. These are the key interfaces uh, that, that uh, need to be there. So in a preliminary design, we should have you know, that kind of understanding that will bring all the parts together and make sure that you didn't uh, miss anything. So um, I did have a question about uh, software. So have you considered what the software requirements are that will go into the uh, processor? Yes, and I'd like to bring up Dakota Berglund to talk about that further for you. Uh, yes, sir, we considered the software requirements. However, none of us are software engineering students nor electrical engineering students. So we deemed that uh, trying to make our own software for this project would be too complex for our two semesters. So the decision was made to use pre-made software from the DJI NASA, which has all the software already pre-programmed in there. All we have to do is change uh, settings on that software to attain our stable system. Okay, so did you take a look at what settings you would have to change and whether or not uh, that, do those settings give you the flexibility that you needed to be able to make the system work? Yes, sir. So it's a PID controller, a portion derivative integral controller. And it also uses the magnetometer, accelerometer, uh, gyroscopic, uh, and GPS, as well as the barometer. So those are all used. And when calibrated, when working, the system should be able to attain this uh, proper stability. Uh, that would be uh, complete, calibration would completed before each flight. Okay, yeah, so I, I get that you're getting used to commercial software. Uh, have you looked, did you actually, you should be able to do kind of the top level requirements for that software to evaluate whether or not the commercial would meet your requirements? Yes, we did. That, that was part of the requirements. Uh, we have match pick, uh, max pitch angle, which the software can adjust. It has a uh, max horizontal velocity during hover mode, which can be adjusted, and the uh, system can be uh, set up for uh, proper use, and that is all changed via software. Everything that it does make requirements. Okay, and then uh, the other thing was, uh, so I was wondering if you took into account on the payload, so this is for Yes, this is very different. Um, on the payload, lowering down the payload, uh, what about rotation of the payload uh, due to winds? Uh, did you do an analysis to determine you know, what kind of effect that would have on the overall vehicle? Yes, the preliminary analysis was done, and for that, I'd like to bring up Simon Bolger, who was our expert in sky green tether system. Uh, yes, sir. During this part of the construct or the design process rather. We worked a lot with the electrical system to ensure that at the 25 foot uh, mark that we were lowering to, that we'd be able to sustain the wind shear. Originally we were actually going with a one tether system, but it was considered there was too much sway in the system, too much potential for sway. So we wanted to go with a three tether system instead to avoid that pendulum motion and avoid any twisting that could try and change the CD or any of the flight characteristics of the hummingbird. So we worked a lot to ensure that that would work. Um, even so, we don't want to risk it. We're going to be operating at as low winds as possible, so preferably under one mile per hour winds, just to avoid any possible uh, overstrain of our flight control. So what were the maximum winds that, were, that the system was designed to, uh, to accommodate? The system was designed to accommodate up to a two mile per hour wind. We did very basic analysis on the payload. Um, we haven't done anything like testing or really advanced analysis on how much how much uh, of a moment that's going to generate on the system. So we've been working under the assumption we'll fly under about two miles per hour. Okay. So in general, uh, uh, 
a lot of you relied a lot on the, uh, the prompt, and it was kind of noticeable that, that you were you know, looking at the prompt rather than engaging the audience. Uh, but uh, some of you did, did better than others uh, at that, but just kind of keep that in mind that uh, when, you're, when you're presenting, uh, you want to engage the audience and uh, you know, kind of talk uh, more naturally. So, uh, but uh, anyway, good job. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, uh, I thought that was a great presentation. You did a great job. I have a few questions. Um, so one thing I didn't see addressed during the presentation was safety. And so my question is, is what do you consider, so I just heard one mile per hour wind. So the, yeah, the question was, was what, what if the wind speed changes is what happens? And then more specifically, what if you lose contact uh, with, with the hummingbird? Then, then what are the next steps when it stops receiving your signal? Well, the safety measures for humans are to make sure that we have a clearance around the hummingbird during operations to avoid any snagging of the propellers. Also, with the internal wire routing for the safety of making sure that you don't get electrocuted and or short out the system and get hurt that way. As for the damage to the actual hummingbird, that's once again a question for Dakota Berkland, who is our operator for the hummingbird once it becomes built. So your question was relating to the uh, connection loss to the hummingbird? Right. So for that, we have the combination of the high-tech Optima and the uh, DJI NASA, those actually work in conjunction when loss of connection is to the ground. The high-tech Optima can switch on to uh, a loss of signal, which switches the NASA over to a GPS attitude hold function. Okay. So it will hold its position until it either regains signal, and then also in the programming of the NASA, we can set an auto land feature if connection is lost. So the hummingbird can land itself in loss of connection. Okay. Uh, I had a question. Um, the, the choice of, of three solenoid claws, um, and then what's is one is one is why three, and two is what happens if say one of them holds on, and you have an off center payload, you know, still attached, and and what what do you expect to happen in that scenario? Well, three solenoid claws were chosen for the three tethers because one of our definitions for the term of stable configuration required not having expected swinging from the pendulum motion or spinning, which is what we expected to have happen with just the one or even two tethers to the solenoid clause. As for the specifics of the solenoid clause and what happens if it's unbalanced, I'd like to bring back up Simon Bolger, who once again is our expert in the solenoid clause. All right, so during a potential failure of one of the solenoids, um, the system could, as, as you said, potentially flip the payload and create a, a pretty awkward situation for us, unfortunately. Um, most of that is, we're going to do a lot of testing on the system to ensure reliability. Uh, we may, if the solenoid is considered too unreliable, which some teams have had issues with solenoids in the past, um, we may switch to a more reliable system, such as a, a servo-based system, which will use the same claw mechanism, just change out the actuator type. So essentially the best I can tell you there is a lot of testing and verification that this will release on time every time. Okay, and all three of these at the same time? Yes, sir. Um, and then the third question I had was, was I saw something about the payload delivery was one foot per second, and it was the, the analysis seemed to be based on the school speed and the dropping of the payload. Um, but then earlier on, you said with the uh, motors that you had an altitude hover of plus or minus three feet. So I was wondering if you had more more bounds on that three feet to be able to lost your three feet to keep your payload delivery within the range, or if that was something you would consider. Sure, I'll bring Dakota back up to talk about the range of hover. So for the plus uh, plus minus the three feet the three feet deviation the analysis was done and. It should not bring us up above our expected uh, landing speed. Uh, that being said, it should be able to hold its altitude because it's using a barometer as well as the accelerometers and the GPS to attain that out to maintain that altitude. As well as I can put in uh, manual controls even during the hover mode to adjust. So if I think the payload's coming down too fast, I can always throttle up and pull out of the landing zone. And once it reached, once the payload reached maximum, I can then manually descend. Okay. Thank you once again. Uh, that was a great presentation. Good project. I have uh, three areas of, uh, of uh, questions and comments. Uh, one is a couple of uh, items in the presentation, another on the department. If you want to go forward, please go to the detailed design. 
I have a question on slides. Could you have a slide coming to please? So if you were to print this out in black and white, which is this color line, you would be able to tell uh, the three dotted lines which one is which. So that's actually a common issue in the industry. Is, uh, there's a lot of people that are color blind, don't print out the slides black and white. So um, I think that's an uh, idea to be very aware of. Just print out your slides in black and white and see if they, they're still readable. Um, also, the graphics are fantastic. Uh, whatever is your CAD or CAD reads are very good. But um, I would recommend that uh, in the future you put uh, key dimensions and uh, identify key uh, parts on the on graphics. So it's uh, helpful for your uh, audience. So look at the items on the presentations. But overall, it's a very good package. I can read every word, which is sometimes very hard. As engineers want to put every word down. So uh, that's a really good uh, text size. And the images were very clear. Thank you. Uh, requirements. Um, how many of you are planning to stick around for the next three detail projects to actually finish this? Um, so I see a huge requirement screen. So with that said, uh, which secondary is a question for any of you? Which secondary or third tertiary requirements are you willing to give up? Uh, big question for our systems lead who also helped generate all those requirements, Sean and Khan. So we've actually gone through, I think, three or four major uh, requirement revisions um, before we had roughly 65 and we trimmed that down to about 44. Um, so in the future, at the beginning of detail, we'll be revisiting those requirements again, um, determining which ones we can actually meet, and um, at least in the time given, and uh, see if we have the capabilities of meeting them based on our analysis from here. I still would like for you to tell me, or take a look at your requirements sheet if you want, and tell me which one of these requirements you're going to be able to, if you can give up without really sacrificing much in terms of your overall mission objectives. Okay. Could you go to slide 89, I believe? Uh, 80. Okay, go to 65. <laughs> it's, okay. Um, Go to slide 70. That should be R3. Uh, 75. Okay, so from R322, we have a requirement that flows down from there. So if you go to slide 74, we have a charge within 50 minutes um, talking to one of our professors. They said that charging within that time lock would most definitely ruin our batteries. So I think in the future, if we were to give up on give up one or relax the requirement, it would be the R three two two E R one. Okay. I think another one is the high speed. So that specialized safety consideration, being able to do it. There's no, especially when you're doing a demo, you want to go nice and slow. You don't want to. There's not. This is not a race. So in operations, that's another requirement. You can just. They were not doing that. Um, and you can just, if somebody asks why, say safety. You don't want to have risk it. So, there's, so certainly, um, I just really took a look. It's really ambitious. It's really cool. You guys did a nice job doing your requirement solution. But um, for the time the constraints that you have on the time for the detail and cost, there's really, you should really think about minimizing that. And it's fine. We could just think about your constraints. Um, then uh, I would certainly say that uh, for our one requirement, the elaboration to the R1 ER, so this is the company where it will be controlled by an operator, the elaboration was sufficient. What you had described for operations, you had really thought about operations, but in terms of the R1 ER1, the Hummingbird shell, you have software that correct executes user input, the requirement would never apply is very viable because you would have additional elaboration. And I think you thought about that, but you didn't actually, I really would have preferred to see those elaborations. Is the design you described let me know that you actually thought about what you need to do, but I didn't see that as a requirement you have to aware of. So that's a, so I highly recommend that's an area where you can actually elaborate. Operability is a huge thing, especially if you're going to pass this off to someone else for years to operate. So do they have to be uh, there? Uh, last items I want to talk um, so that Joey has a chance to talk as well. Last few items. Um, I was surprised at the materials for the. Um, uh, the, the, the hub was different than the landing gear. 
Um, Simplicity-wise, I would have expected them to be the same. So could you talk a little bit about what you thought about keep making the same and why you chose to have different? Yes, material traces have been performed for every single component of the airframe, and to talk about that, I'd like to bring up our structural lead, which is Kyle Miller. Thank you, Michaela. Um, so your question was about why the material is different. Actually, we have looked into some possible problems with the difference in material. Um, if you could go to slide 109, please. So here's the contact um, between the aluminum and the carbon fiber. And uh, we know that when carbon fiber touches aluminum, sometimes it can react and cause corrosion. However, um, we are going to put a small layer of cloth um, in between. Um, and we have confirmed with some of the professors that this would be sufficient to permit that, um, prevent that. Um, we don't see really any structural issues with the difference in materials. Um, did you have any specifically? Well, I was thinking of if this takes a hard landing, mm -hmm. uh, that the, the landing gears probably would be pretty easy to replace to a machine, but the composites, if they get damaged, that's it, game over. So I was thinking I would have would have thought that <laughs> like I have a using the same aluminum as you use for landing gears as the hub. Is that be machined to replace? You could probably have a spare available you can shop here versus having to rely on the external contractor and it's a one done deal. So that's really where it's coming from. So I really um, encourage you to consider that case study and to see if you can make it work with the aluminum for them. If not, that's fine, but I think you should revisit that particular decision. Um, and just FYI, you guys should really think how whoever's doing your procurement for detailed design should think about what spares you're gonna buy. Blades break, motors break, cell motors break. So that's gonna be a big deal to see the concentration of having those. Uh, where are your single quick failures? Do lose one thing, you can't finish the project. Um, so I would highly recommend that. And um, did you guys do analysis on, last question, on the mass of the wire requirements? Uh, so the mass of the wire? Yeah, it's all. Um, um, yes, actually, so the tether wire, the fishing line is you know extremely light, like its density is like 0 .00. Zero zero three or something like that pounds per per inch, you know, linear density, something like that. And uh, the wire itself um, should weigh uh, less than 0.2 pounds, based on our estimate. It's a 28 gauge wire, so it, it only has a 0 0.03 uh, inch diameter um, total with insulation and all. So um, it's really extremely compact. And and we like if you look here, we actually have. One, we have 25 feet of wire and fishing line split onto this right now um, in one of the channels. The other channels don't have them, but uh, it's hard to see. But uh, pretty much, you can see how small um, everything is. And wait, uh, yeah, so. I was thinking more of the electrical wiring. Wiring all those components up can be quite actually uh, a bit of a mess. Um, uh, most projects aren't just going to need that much of wiring. That wiring they need to connect all the electrical components together. So. Uh, so I really have a healthy margin for the uh, wiring, electrical wiring requirements uh, that you guys are uh, thinking about. To go to all the pieces that need the power and rate control. Okay. I apologize. I thought you were talking about specifically yeah. the sky train. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. All right. I'll be quick. Nice job, guys. That's really impressive. Um, great, great presentation. So a lot of my questions have been covered already. Um, so one one overarching question that I have: um, Do you guys feel that you have a sufficient verification plan written out to verify all these requirements? The testing procedures have not yet been written, but they have been considered and preliminarily thought of. So they are not written down anywhere, and we'll go over those in more detail once we get to the detailed semester. But we have thought of what we can anticipate thus far, which is obviously going to fall short when it actually comes to testing. That's always a concern that we have is, um, is requirement verification, you know, you, you kind of kick the can down the road and and there's there's usually um, a lot of time at the end where you're scrambling to try to verify some requirements that at most, in most cases, are poorly written to begin with. So that's just something to, to consider and be concerned about. Um, and then for me, what's, what's really important is um, understanding the off-dominant scenarios. So along those lines, did you guys think about 
setting up, and this might be later down the road, but a stress test matrix for um, you know the, the flight controller to understand any report, true performance thresholds, and is there um, any redundancy, for instance, in the design of the propellers if you have like a propeller out scenario? Is that in commission? Um, those type of scenarios, have you guys have any? I'm going to give that question to Shana Khanna, who's our systems lead. So actually, I actually also wanted to answer your question before that, but I can answer the, the one that you're talking about right now. Um, for to prevent what, like our motors burning out, we're going to be using fuses uh, and testing it on the ground to verify that our system doesn't short out anywhere and that our electrical components stay optimal. Um, with the previous question, we actually did a verification of whether we would be testing, analyzing, inspecting, or demonstrating each requirement. And, and then later, you'll think about the details of, of what test you would do. What, what analysis? Yeah, we've kind of thought about it uh, off the top of our heads of how we would go about each requirement and um, I guess verifying it through testing or analysis or it, th those four things. Uh, we, we've thought about some of that but haven't written it out. Okay, good. Um, and then just uh, three more things really quick. Um, one, did you think about including any attitude break requirements? Uh, I would like to bring you up Dakota for that. So currently we do not have any attitude break requirements, we do have attitude requirements. So on the PID we can control the rate, so, but that was never thought of being put into a requirement. It might be something to consider, we've that for um, The other thing, is this is just a nit, on diagrams when we talk about both and not, if you could actually put up a, a diagram indicating, because there were a, a couple miscommunications that we had on MSL where we can clarify that in conversation. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, did I miss it? Is there a wind speed, max wind speed operational requirement that I missed? So the, there is not the wind speed, but I'll have to So the flight controller, I don't remember the spe specifics as to what uh, wind speed it can accommodate for, but as part of a risk analysis that we performed, uh, in the case where we get a sudden uh, wind spike, we would abort procedures and land the, the system. And we would have to come up with some kind of guideline as to what our maximum wind speed that we can fly in would be. Okay. Good. Um, that's all awesome. Well, thank you so much to everybody who came, especially the panelists and our guests. We really enjoy being able to present our product to you. We put our hearts and souls into this, and we are very excited for the next process of actually constructing the Hummingbird. So I know I speak on behalf of everyone on Team Descent when I say that we look forward to seeing you all here in December when we have a prototype of our Hummingbird system. Thank you so much, and have a good rest of your day.